Uh, I think I can speak out loud for you to hear me. Uh, our guest speak out for tonight has some uh, has some kind of one more. So right now we are pleased to announce to you that guest speaker is here with us, and uh, the lecture will proceed as we are planning. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. D. O. Okwaka, who is today the Consul General of Nigeria, uh, the Consul General of Nigeria in New York. Mr. Okwaka. Fellow Nigerians and friends of Nigeria, as the president has said, I could not be here before now because of some problems beyond my control, we would say. I am deeply sorry for keeping you waiting. So please forgive me. On behalf of the Honorable Consul General who has sent me to represent him, I thank the Nigerian Students Union at Iowa State University for your kind invitation to participate at the first ever Nigerian week. I know that you will somehow be disappointed that the Honorable Consul General is not attending personally. He has asked me to apologize on his behalf because your invitation came when he had, he had accepted another equally important invitation for another occasion. I am very pleased to be called upon to present a brief expose on the role of the military in Nigeria and the impending return to civilian rule. No topic could have been better suited for this occasion because we have an opportunity to reflect on the state and expectations of our fatherland at this crucial transitional period. I will not bother you with stories of what Nigeria was during the colonial era. These are well known to all and sundry. Our country attained independence on 1st October 1960, after over 50 years of British rule, the civilian government which took over from the British lasted for five years. Disruptive forces in the form of ethnic particularism quickly led to the collapse of, po of political structure which culminated in the military takeover in January 1966, and which in turn led to a civil war from 1967 to 1970. From the ruins of an unfortunate fratricidal war, the military were able to keep the country stronger and more united. Earlier on, the creation of 19 states had diminished the fear of the minority groups and kindled the spirit of competition and intensified the economic development of our people. Under the military regime, 
the activities of pre-independence period, which we are characterized by lack of coordinated and development programs, gave way to regulated economic programs, which laid emphasis on the development of the infrastructure, namely the construction of schools, roads, rails, airports, telecommunication, water supply, and other vital amenities. Attempts were made to meet the requirements of a potentially vigorous economy that had, that had suddenly awakened. The boom in oil caused an explosion in economic activity. Consequently, growth was overwhelming and remained in Satyevo. Our facilities were overloaded, and the inevitable result was that it would take time and practice to put things together satisfactorily. And that's why you hear of crash programs here and there. The rudimentary financial arrangements which had served the interest of the colonial administration have been overhauled. The ownership of our capital base has been restructured so as to allow Nigerians to control their destiny. In this case, while the government continues to maintain an open door policy about foreign investments in Nigeria, and provide fiscal, fiscal and other incentives for the participation of foreign capital in, all, in almost all the areas of interest. It has introduced an enlightened industrialization policy which classifies all economic and commercial activities into three main categories and prescribes various permissible levels of foreign participation for each. This arrangement is designed to ensure indigenous participation in the economic life of the nation, guarantee active local support of foreign capital through shared risks with Nigerian capital, and diffuse pent-up feelings against neocolonialism, which is seen through the semblance of exclusive and therefore seemingly exploitative foreign capital. A few people believed the military authorities when they announced in July 1975 that they were going to hand over power to the civilians. But today it is a reality. The military have not only fulfilled their promises, but they are doing so ahead of schedule. Indeed, Political civilian rule has already been introduced at the grassroots with the local government reforms of August 1976, which brought local administration to the common man. This was followed by the drafting of a new constitution providing for a presidential system. The Constitution was examined and adopted with some amendments by a democratically elected Constituent Assembly. The final draft was launched by the federal government last year. Then the ban on political activities which had been enforced since January 1966 was subsequently lifted. Consequently, five political parties have now been formed and are actively campaigning for presidential and gubernatorial elections and for elections to the federal and state legislatures. Today, our strength at home is reflected in the success of our dynamic foreign policy. Today, our country is a friend to all and enemy to none. 
Today, our country's voice is heard at the Security Council, of which we are a member. Our influence is strongly felt in the various international organizations. Our troops are keeping peace in Lebanon and in the Republic of Chad. Today, our goal towards a strong African, um, a strong Africa through regional groupings, such as econ the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, is in the process of being realized. All these achievements are a credit to Nigerian diplomacy. Some people have criticized the military administration for its decision to move the federal capital to Abuja for its radical reform of the land tenure system, for allegedly going back on its policy of free education at all levels, for its failure to nationalize all multinational companies who have dealings with the Pretoria and the Salisbury regimes, or Salisbury, whatever you call it. <laughs> Others have condemned outright all the achievements of the military administration on the ground that it has failed to give the country a reliable national census. But experience has shown that most of these criticisms stem from vested interest and ignorance of government attitude and decisions on these matters. It is now left to the civilian administration to prove that they are capable of governing the country, that which they have been itching for during the past 13 years. In this vein, as in this vein you as students and leaders of tomorrow have a primary role to play. You should bear in mind that no society has ever been changed by people who live outside it. The change always comes from within. So no matter, no, no amount of criticisms you make from here, we change our society unless you go home and operate from within. That's when you finish your course, instead of staying here, and squatting here and there, <laughs> <laughs> and constituting a burden to our very uh, good hosts, you, you, and forgetting that your proper place is at home. The change, as I said, the change always comes from within. You must now join hands with your colleagues at home and elsewhere to give our country the right and disciplined leadership. It is not enough to blame the military for what you believe they have failed to do or what you feel they have wrongly done or what you think they should have done. The question now is, what you yourself can do for that country. And since Nigeria has adopted a presidential system, more or less modeled on the presidential system of our host country, you are in a better place to contribute more meaningfully and influence the course of events in the crucial days ahead. I thank you for listening. I have to apologize that I read most of the speech. In a situation like this, we prefer reading our speech for fear of being quoted out of context. Um, thank you, Mr. Quaker.
Uh, we will entertain some uh, questions from the audience. So if you uh, have any question you want to ask our honorable guest, <coughs> feel free to do so. Yeah, I have absolute confidence. <laughs> um, in the civilians, I think they have been, as I said, they have been yearning for this for almost 13 years now. And we have um, probably the best administrators among the civilians. So why can't they make it? I personally am optimistic that they will make it. There are bound to be some problems, you know, which from time to time makes you feel, I mean, demoralizes you, but I think that eventually they will triumph. They have no alternative anyway. Their failure means the military continue. And I think they have been saying that they want the military to go. <laughs> so this is a lifetime challenge. So the campaigns are being are going on in our I mean, in our usual way. Maybe it's not as refined as what you see here, you know. But we hope that uh, they will eventually go over the storm. Yeah, we have at present about um, 30 to 35,000 Nigerian students in the U.S. Uh, what about the students from here? How much how many are going to study in Nigeria? Yes. It would be a, a negligible few who go in for research probably. Uh? Is it possible for students who want to do the research? In Nigeria? Yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. Recently, about 10 of them applied for visa to do research in Kainjida. I think from Atlanta, Georgia institution. I mean, about 10 of them are, are probably in Nigeria as of today, doing research in Kainjida. So I think. Uh, I hope they'll be able to pay their fees. <laughs> if they don't pay, then we will not grant them peace.
Yeah, they run, we run into trouble, everybody, you and the military. Because um, when the scheme was launched, I don't think we had accurate statistics on our student population. So we thought with the oil boom that um, we could have coped up with the freeness in that field, but uh, midway some problems arose, and uh, I think they are reviewing it as of today. No, they are reviewing, gradually reviewing the whole system, the whole scheme. You, there are students still on scholarship, isn't it? Yeah, most of the, I mean, I'd, uh, I think the scheme is probably, perform, I mean, functioning 60, 70%. The oil is not flowing as before. You know. <laughs> so the free education will also match pari passu with the flow of oil. <laughs> But now that uh, probably we get more money from our oil, maybe okay. things will <laughs> after the OPEC meeting, yeah? Pardon? Is there any guarantee? Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> I think the guarantee is the civilians themselves. Yes. If they do well, no military man is coming back. But if they don't do well, then. Uh, You know, you will know. Before 1966, you knew that probably the military needed to come. So also in 10, 20 years, you may also be in that position. But I'm optimistic that the civilians will make it. They have learned the hard way their counterparts here and there as we have been enjoying and have been <coughs> in prison. <laughs> so now that they are being released from their prison and given the manna from heaven, I don't see why they shouldn't make use of it. If we knew one or two who have gone and come back, we would have hired some sociologists amongst us here to examine them. And you, <laughs> <laughs> and you find that they are more American than Nigeria. And at times you find that maybe they got married here. Their wives were here, and they just told them, please wait till I'm going to see what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> so they go home, and uh, 
go to one or two offices, they say, ah, no hope. Then they just jump into the plane. And any one of you who is serious in going back will find a job. Look at the Indians are managing our railway. <laughs> it's because we, well, they no, we ha don't have people to mind them, probably. Yeah. Well, one is you have to accept the system at home. Eh? The, the, our, host, our hosts here have their system, isn't it? There is an American system, isn't it? I believe there is an American system. There is also a Nigerian system. When you are in the, in the U.S., you have to accept the U.S. system. And when you go back home, you have to uh, try to uh, live under the Nigerian system. If you try to import the American system to the Nigerian, then you, that's where the conflict starts. Because here, for example, you pick up the phone. phone. At home, you may waste two, three, four minutes before you get a data office. And then the salary here is more appetizing than what you have there. Here you ride a car. Maybe at home you will uh, struggle for a week or two or a month before you get your car. So these are, you know, problems in our system. If you are prepared to accommodate them, then there is no reason why you cannot survive there. So please, when, when you decide to go home, let it be a firm decision, you know. Not a marginal, let me go and see what they are doing there. <laughs>